you are very uh, big experts here dinesh ragunandan tripti srenjeev and sri kumar i don't have much to say maybe i'll say why this manelth is important see idvarikum namma ella pandrad enna na ore ore health department mattum will start working but there are certain problems where health department alone will not be able to give a full solution this is where the multiple departments role is very very critical see one common example which we right now see is your uh, rabies if you want to control rabies what we at the health department is giving is go on give vaccination as a post exposure prophylaxis but this will not the problem now in case if the dark bites are increasing we are going to go on increase it but there will be a interruption in the dosage rabies will continue to come and financially this may not be sustainable if you see the cost of the vaccine which we are giving it will not handle the our future problem particularly when urbanization and this dark population is increasing it's going to be so what to do is where the other departments role is coming the one part is the clinical management of post expo prophylaxis or rabies case if it comes the second part is the how to control the animal population where your urban local body role is there in abc method or what about the vaccination annual vaccination for animal population so that what we can do is then source reduction in the animal population if we are able to do it we can control it and there's a big role for many other department including diagnostics coordination report collection all those things in fact the government of india already come out with a strategic plan which our panelist will discuss in detail with the small introduction i'll request uh, dr dinesh to start the process yeah uh, thank you dr selva can i have my slides uh, i have a few slides before moving on to the session dr dinesh nayar a senior health specialist with the world bank uh, he is a health specialist in health nutrition population global practice at the world bank lead support for health system resilience in south asia and india he is based in washington dc and brings over 30 years of experience before joining the world bank he has served as a health advisor at the uk's department of international development he holds a master's degree in health administration and undergraduate in medicine thank you sir thank you um i don't need to stress uh, the importance of um, of of one health uh, specifically because if you look at it in the global context we have been seeing a vast increase in the in the interface between uh, wildlife livestock and the hu and humans um, with deforestation increasing urbanization this has become the reality of our lives and many of you will remember even during lockdown when you could see many of the animals that you would not see beginning to come out onto the onto the streets so you really see that we have been encroaching onto the onto the habitats and with that we have now even more greater chances of spillover of of diseases from human from animals to humans which is what we are very interested in if you look at it these outbreaks have increased in between over the between 2008 to 2018 you can see the huge increase that is there at the same time if you look at it specifically in the south and southeast asia context many of our health systems still need a lot of emphasis in strengthening Uh, preparedness in strength in strengthening prevention activities um, so clearly the zoonotic diseases and one health 
is an important priority for the day. Again, I want to really stress this fact that an ounce of prevention is much more better than, than preparedness or even response. The aftermath of the COVID pandemic is still with us. The huge economic losses that were created as part of that. If you look at it, the, the, even from prevention to preparedness, the, the margins are three times. So really putting your money in prevention is one of the most important aspects as far as we can, we can do in this, in this context of where One Health and um, zoonotic diseases has become so important. I'll try to summarize in my very short presentation what are some of the global lessons in terms of institutionalizing One Health that is there. Clearly, we cannot do everything. The first is to really try to focus on really what are the priorities within the geographical region that we are working in. For example, in US, they prioritized eight diseases through consultations with many different neighboring countries and others. In West Africa, they have basically really focused down on the top four uh, diseases that are there that affect them, last fever, Rift Valley, Ebola, and COVID-19. Clearly, because there are a humongous number of diseases that are there, trying to be more focused is a critical priority. A second key, uh, key uh, lesson from global experiences is trying to develop cross-cutting tools to guide action. So basically trying to benchmark. So for example, the European uh, uh, area looks at surveillance evaluation frameworks, benchmarking capacity, capacity evaluation, so that you are basically have comparison upon who is the weaker one. Because a weak link can then basically be the entry point for many of these. So you might be a very strong country, but if your neighbors are weak, then you are also as well exposed. A third critical priority is to support intra and intersectoral collaboration and to create the necessary bodies. US created the One Health Federal Agency. India really came up with this One Health mission and One Health, which is now under the Chief's Principal Scientific Advisor to support the coordination of activities. Similarly, in Brazil, we have the One Health Brazil that is there that basically brings all the various parts uh, together. So having a central focus agency that sits outside is very useful. <coughs> Data is a key enabler and clearly continuously reviewing, monitoring, modeling, is going to be very important. If you look at it in the Europe, they are doing this, uh, looking at surveillance options and foodborne bacteria through this project talks uh, that is there. Investing in capacity, we will hear more, is critical. And really building capacities in frontline, in epidemiology, in biostatistics is going to be very critical. You have, let's say, many of these uh, countries, specifically Africa, Europe, really creating models and, and targeted training programs to strengthen the capacity. The, if we, so cre but beyond all this, there are critical enablers. And those critical enablers include leadership, you need champions because you need the full political leadership because it is so much easier to build health facilities and to build uh, big hospitals. But really preparing and working towards the unknown or working towards an eventual outbreak is much more important and that requires really political leadership. And then you need to basically work through differences because everybody is so comfortable working in their own silos. The animal husbandry 
is happy to work with its own similarly we need to reach out to each other to be able to to make those bridges across the different departments um, data sharing and interoperability is very important the health human health needs to understand what are the new animal health diseases so that they can be prepared and similarly you need to have to because you need to work with the private sector in the human health and, and almost 60% of the care goes into the private sector but even within the animal health sector we all know livestock aquaculture is basically dairy is basically private sector so this is the time to act because clearly beyond the human impacts it has an economic impact it reduces for example in covid itself we saw that if the pandemic created an impact on our on our gdp and the tourism industry similarly promoting making sure we work with the private investments is going to be there because finally a prevention is much more important than anything else i'll stop there um, because we have many more speakers who will go into the details and who will tell us what how the impact that we can create in in tamil nadu itself thank you dinesh rendu moonu point nalla alaga solli irukkaru so one vandu the issue is not only with the world life even the livestock ku priya issue ah da irukum we need to handle that and how to bring in the multidisciplinary team into this ennoda personal opinion na as on now uh, it not only causing a problem in the human life but once it have a wind blow it have an outbreak achina the entire mass killing of the livestock which we undertake it's a huge impact on the population so that also we need to handle it now i request our ragnandan sir to start the presentation you already know about him he is the one uh, tertiary care person who used to associate with the primary care continuously sir over to you sir sir the slide board pa thank you chair uh, before i start my presentation i want to place my sincere thanks to director of public health ably led by our uh, dr selva vinayam sir and the team ably led by dr vinay and his team for inviting me to to be here today in fact <coughs> one health concept vandu idu vandu tamil nadu porthu irukku it's not a new concept we have been doing it in fact we should feel uh, happy that in the whole india our state is the first state to initiate this project in 2015 itself the government of tamil nadu ministry of health has brought out a manual with the guidelines how to implement this one health concept and as a clinician as a physician handling the infectious diseases in our state you should know that nearly 60 to 70% of our infectious diseases are zoonotic so it may increase at least now thanks to the recent outbreaks of covid and other diseases now the human animal conflicts how they are the potential resources for the infections are well known to our public and i'm glad that this topic has been taken today for the discussion and for panel discussion <clears throat> so before i just go to the we'll just let us have a clarity in what really we mean by one health it is defined as a collaborative multi sectoral transdisciplinary approach again working at different levels that is a key so that is where the role of primary care starts it starts from local regional national and global levels with the goal of achieving optimal health outcomes recognizing the interconnection between people animals plants and their shared environment friends <coughs> today we know that suppose if a outbreak occurs in one part of the world it can it can spread across the world in 36 hours it seems so in 36 hours the whole global can be infected so that is the place so no longer we can isolate of local or national we have to be concerned with global health and that is the one area of one health is also talking so no longer we talk of only human health today i think our honorable minister also told and sir was also mentioning dpsr in the morning how we play with environmental issues and we are not 
giving importance and of course animal health so today when we talk of own health we can't ignore the environment and the health of the animals yeah i think this is a very interesting slide i just want to say only one point from this slide how you can see from the animals how the spillover can occur to the human or a bigger animals or what we call it as a domestic animal so the starts from the zoonotic from the forestry or a wild animals through the vectors it can come to the domestic animals from domestic animals how it can go to the human amplification just look at the bottom line what is the incubation period so it's just a matter of one to two months the transition can occur from a wild to a human impact that's what we already saw in the covid we can keep on debating which from which animal it came but it's a different story but the message is we can't ignore the health of the animals again i'm sorry this is a old slide but still it talks about every today we are getting updated every day we are talking about uh, emerging and reemerging diseases throughout the world again this is a important slide just to know that already in our state or in our country rabies anthrax brucellosis toxoplasmosis they are all there we already we we live with that but most important is reemerging on especially in our state we know in few district japanese encephalitis is especially madurai i think it's a challenge you know the pigs are the vectors so i mean the resources of infections so that is a area again leptospirosis is a elijorongrudi it's a very common term namma oorla ellarkum therinja vishayam again scrub the scrub typhus ngrudu vandu it is again namma tamil nadu poruthurku or anji important diseases starting from dengue dengue vittutomna lepto is a zoonotic scrub is a zoonotic so we have to, of course other uh, rabies and other things are there so again case in our forest disease again namalukku ooti la vandu or periya challenge because i have been involved in all these activities in whatever i am sharing today is all my personal experience of visiting those places and sharing the realities so in, uh, across the karnataka border we had a challenge monkey deaths unnatural monkey deaths so immediately the population in that area have to be vaccinated for case in forest disease again it mimics like a hemorrhagic fever so again the most challenging is the emerging so globally today as i said within 30 cc covers any disease can spread across so we have to be very very careful again i was thinking in the congo hemorrhagic fever one day i thought it's in congo but we should know that it is being reported in gujarat already in gujarat they have reported more than <coughs> 50 to 100 cases so it's not far from our own state of course our h1n1 and other things nipa always a threat is starts from kerala we are just <laughs> waiting that it doesn't cross the border to our state again avian influenza again sir has already mentioned the reasons about so i don't want to go into the debt like just read the readings headlines globalization again unprecedented growth environmental changes and global warming sir was also mentioning about dengue usually it's a monsoon disease today we are getting across the every year uh, every month of the year industrialization again unplanned uncontrolled urbanization most important is increased animal and human interface which we are experiencing now and microbiological adaptation and improvement on diagnostics again makes us to diagnose many emerging and reemerging diseases so i'll just quickly i already mentioned about congo hemorrhagic fever again nipa it's a challenge for us in fact when we had this ebola that's the first experience we had when we ebola was reported in west african countries our state was prepared to handle these kind of patients so the challenge was we have to create a separate isolation ward with all the specifications of who and everybody was really worried who will we had four people who came from western africa to rajiv gandhi government general hospital we have to make them isolated for one week everybody were hesitant to go inside because we don't know whether they are carrying the infection or not so these were the challenges that we have to experience but all those challenges helped us to handle the h1 in fact i should thank h1n1 helped us to handle our covid so whatever the experience we got in covid i think every one of us experienced it so that kind of preparedness is very very important when you are addressing a zoonotic diseases many more maybe on the pipeline like west nile we are not yet seen that
Yeah, again, sir mentioned about rabies. Again, at this moment, I want to say our state is the only state where we administer ARV 24 by 7, including primary health centers and immunoglobulins free of cost. So we are now handling, but at the same time, we need help from the animal husbandry and uh, veterinary science where we have to handle the animals. Today, not only the dog bite, even wild animal bite is a challenge for us in thing. Of course, scrub typhus, as I said, it mimics like a dengue-like picture and produces hemorrhagic manifestation. So similarly on leptospirosis. So we already mentioned about that. Again, we have to be cautious about these kind of things can be used as a bioterrorism. So that awareness, even the plague, they were sending through the letters like that. So be aware of this, using this as a bioterrorism. Next slide. Yeah, again. So what are the lessons? So we have to be careful that we are going to have more to emerge or something which is re-emerging. Early diagnosis, again, that is a very key area and planning. Surveillance is very important. My subsequent speakers are going to talk on the surveillance and other sharing of information. We have to develop guidelines, local guidelines. Surveying the animal is very, very important. And most important is intersectoral coordination. That's what today in the panel also we can see people across the specialities are sitting here. Again, so this, don't worry about this content, but that shows who are all the players of one health. So I was, when I go through it, around 35 to 40 players are there in one health. I have to work together to handle this problem. So this is a slide when we prepared for H1N1 isolation in GH. And I, I use this particular slide that time. I am talking before COVID. I said one day will come where doctors have to be treating like this every patient. So what we said nearly 10 years back has happened during COVID. So, <clears throat> so to conclude, these are the various issues that we have to address in our uh, approach to this one health concept. Again, human, animal, and environment cannot be ignored. So please be remember these three work together and we have to address the issues together. And I want to conclude with uh, Virchow's statement of one world, one medicine, and one health. Between animal and human medicine, there are no dividing line, nor there should be. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe if there are any questions, we can... this session and uh, before I start my session I would like to just give the overview about what is the capaci capacity building is required for One Health. The previous two speakers uh, Dinesh sir and Raghunanta sir they have given the overview of One Health. So what is this One Health? When you go to the WHO site they have mentioned One Health is nothing but it is an integrated unifying approach and to balance and optimize the health of human, animal, and environment. So in One Health, we are not only dealing with the health of human beings, but we are also talking about the health of animal. We are all also talk talking about the health of environment. So do we have One Health professionals available in our country or in Tamil Nadu? Right now, there is no uh, what is called as a curriculum, which is mainly focusing on the One Health, creating the One Health professional cadre. We have some of the agencies, they are providing courses on the One Health, but that is also overview. Like the Public Health Foundation of India, they are having few courses, and even the PhD, uh, they are offering PhDs on One Health. The recently in 2023, the ICMR Regional Medical Research Center, Bhubaneswar, they released one online course on the One Health. So what should be this One Health and how we need to create the One Health professional cadre? So what are the capacity building components to be considered uh, for having the capacity of this particular manpower? So. To develop this particular, there is one program which was 
launched for this One Health, that is a national program for One Health for the prevention and control of the xenosis. So one of the important component, this particular program is having six component. One of the important component is, that is the integrated manpower development through capacity building. So how to build the capacity and who can play important role into this? So as I told that One Health, it is not only related to the health of human, so it is related to the health of animal as well as the health of environment. So it is not only the professionals from the medical sciences to be taken or considered for the capacity building. So when we are preparing a curriculum for the One Health, we need to consider the people from the different sector, that is from the veterinary science, from the ecology. So this particular, to operationalize this One Health mechanism, the manpower development through capacity building, it is very important. So how to do this? So we can have some competences, competency-based framework, which can be utilized to prepare this particular cadre so that they can deal with the issues raised because of the interface of the animal, human, and environment. So how it is, it is to be started? The first track, which need to be implemented that whenever we are starting this, we need to do the mapping of the opportunities, mapping of the resources, mapping of the curricula at the national, state, and district level. So the baseline, once the baseline information is acquired, this baseline information can be used to identify gaps in that particular district or state level. And as per that, finding after finding out the gap, the gap need to be filled with the, uh, what is called the solution. So what is to be done here, the competency-based framework can be developed and it should be based on three main areas, that is skills, then values and attitudes, and knowledge. So now One Health, it, it is not only you will sit in one classroom and the cadre of the One Health professional to be created. For that, there is one course which was developed by the NCDC, that is the Field Epidemiology Training Program. So taking these professionals in the field and showing them, asking them to map out the problems and then asking them to find out solution and providing the resources for that, that can be done by this particular mechanism. So Tamil Nadu, we already, uh, we have seen from the morning that the Tamil Nadu is having very uh, good public health system and uh, there are, each district is having the medical colleges. These medical colleges along with the relevant multi, uh, the sectors can be taken into consideration and this medical colleges can be used for the training of the relevant sector people. That one, uh, this medical colleges can be used for the uh, capacity building program. So whatever it is available, so one CDC Atlanta, they are also saying that One Health, it is a collaborative, sectoral and transdisciplinary approach. So what is this transdisciplinary? So transdisciplinary, that means that the people, they need to be taken into the field, they need to interact with the uh, members of the community, they need to talk with the policy uh, makers and uh, based on that, they, they can conduct the operational research and how this is how we can train and create the uh, workforce for the manpower, uh, One Health uh, professionals. So this is about the capacity building of the One Health professional and I'll conclude my session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tripti. Uh, thank you for, uh, for highlighting the important role of capacity building as well as uh, the importance of using existing uh, resources like medical colleges and others to actually uh, strengthen um, the workforce and towards One Health. Um, um, we, let's move to the next uh, speaker, which we have uh, Dr. Chiranjeev Bhattacharya, who is from the UNDP and is a national program manager. And um, he will take us through issues around intersectoral coordination and digitalization. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nair. Uh, 
very good afternoon uh, firstly i would like to begin by uh, thanking government of tamil nadu uh, director sir and all the organizers of dphicon 2023 uh, for inviting undp to be part of this uh, conference and sharing some of our insights uh, mostly based on our work uh, we we have been doing with with the government so uh, uh, as you have seen that most of our panelists we are focusing on certain uh, sub themes of one health so i would like to focus on the importance of intersectoral uh, coordination and data system which includes uh, you know data reporting and using data for action okay so uh, as i think we have been hearing since the beginning of this discussion uh, in one health what are the focus area of course one is that we have to integrate the different sectors that is animal plant and uh, human sector second we have to enhance uh, the surveillance and response mechanism in all these sectors so we have to integrate and enhance and lastly we have to have strong communication coordination and collaboration between these sectors so this words looks very simple but in reality in the ground we all know that it is quite difficult to do so uh, in terms of intersectoral or interdepartmental coordination i think dr nair already mentioned uh, india is one of the example wherein uh, uh, different structures has been uh, made functional at the national level and state level uh, with renewed focus on one health uh, after the pandemic but as our panelist has mentioned there has been uh, work around one health both at national level and state level even before the pandemic but now we have structures in place so at the national level uh, uh, the, in the office of the principal scientific advisor uh, a one health mission is envisaged uh, although that mission is yet to be uh, officially launched but that is in the pipeline also uh, the uh, the division of zoonotic disease uh, prevention and control under the national center for disease control has been recently renamed as the center for one health and and they have been uh, leading many of the one health uh, interventions like as uh, dr tripti ma'am was mentioning the national one health program for prevention and control of zoonosis uh, national rabies control program a new program is coming on uh, snake bite and venoming and other zoonotic diseases so uh, that program has been implementing a certain structure at the state and district level for example now many states have one health task force at the state level and also state and district level uh, zoonotic uh, zoonosis coordination committees as well as coordination committees for prevention and control of rabies so i think uh, now a sort of uh, the blueprint or the road map for this coordination structure has been rolled out but with their clear tors like what which are the departments and what are their jobs and responsibilities in this integrated approach but implementation in the ground is in the initial stage and as as uh, other panelists have been mentioning there are so many departments starting from the human health department animal husbandry wildlife municipal department urban affairs department and so many uh, so it's a it's a integrated approach involving all this department and as my previous panelist ma'am has spoken on details about joint training program so not only uh, will this uh, integrated uh, coordination mechanism required but we need to have integrated training uh, so that we have one health experts available with interdisciplinary skills and knowledge and also uh, the last important point for uh, intersectoral uh, collaboration or coordination is information exchange so uh, we know that for uh, for one health one of the important parameters is we should have integrated uh, disease information and uh, actionable information which can be used for response so that will require uh, different sectors to work together and exchange their data so this is something which is very difficult to do but this is what which has to be done for a one health approach so in my subsequent slide i am going to talk about that so as i have mentioned that uh, now the center for one health is uh, under ncdc is working with the state governments on developing a different state action plan 
So right now, uh, two sets of state action plans are being developed. One is the state action plan for uh, prevention and control of zoonosis. Uh, so recently, states like Rajasthan, uh, Odisha have uh, developed such action plan, which is following a One Health approach. And parallelly, uh, states are also developing a state and district action plan for uh, dog-mediated rabies elimination by 2030 because that has been a priority program under the Center for One Health. So I'm happy to share that uh, in this, uh, Puducherry followed by Tamil Nadu has already completed their workshop and I think we had the Tamil Nadu workshop in August this year and now they are finalizing their state and district action plan for dog-mediated rabies elimination by 2030. But once this implement, uh, once these action plans are ready, the next step will be to plan the implementation or the operational modalities, and also how do you monitor the implementation. Now, as I was mentioning about data sharing and reporting in One Health, so uh, right now what we have is we have multiple standalone uh, digital platforms run by different ministries. So, uh, Human Health, we all know, IDSP is there. Similarly, for animal husbandry, we have NADRES, which is National Animal Disease uh, Referral Expert System. We have INAP, which is Information Network for Animal Productivity and Health. Then there is Indian Network for Fisheries and Animal uh, Animals Antimicrobial Resistance, INFAR. And then for our ISRO, we have the uh, Bhuvan system for geo, uh, geolocations of uh, environmental conditions and diseases. So right now, varied uh, uh, sort of portals are there and uh, data sharing among them is extremely difficult, especially in the animal sector, as you know that uh, the, data, the information is related to the economic activity and livelihood of population. For example, if there is an outbreak of a disease uh, in livestock, it basically affects the livelihood and economic uh, condition of uh, families and community. So to uh, maintain data conf confidentiality and share the data is not that easy. So those challenges are there. But uh, we all know that uh, having uh, the One Health approach for effectively using for prevention and uh, preventing any future pandemic, this is the way forward. So what are some of the things that has been done recently is, uh, I think in the beginning of this year, uh, the erstwhile additional secretary in charge of uh, uh, NCDC, uh, Sri Lav Agarwal, who is uh, no longer in the position. So he has initiated a activity involving the center, uh, center of One Health and UNDP, wherein we have had uh, discussions with all these ministries that I mentioned before. And uh, we have then made field visits to this ministry set with their people and try to identify what are the indicators they are tracking. And within those indicators, what are the challenges in sharing those data? And then what are the indicator which actually need to be shared across platforms for actionable, uh, actionable information? So that work has been initiated. Uh, so we, what we are emphasizing is as a way forward, uh, we, we will uh, have a national level working group to work on that and subsequently this Integrated One Health portal uh, is envisaged to be piloted in one to two states. So maybe uh, Tamil Nadu, as being the lead pioneers in so many things, can be uh, uh, one of the pilot states for this. Uh, the other area which which need to be looked at is uh, is the data sharing uh, from the one hand sentinel surveillance uh, side. So as you know, uh, the national uh, 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 program for prevention and control of uh, zoonosis with One Health approach. They are implementing the One Health Sentinel surveillance sites. That means uh, there are Sentinel surveillance sites both in the human sector as well as animal sector. And I think World Bank is also playing an important role in this activity. So I think uh, in that system right now we are uh, capturing the information, the data, but whether we are using that data for disease analytics and disease modeling so that we are getting early early warnings of any uh, change in disease, disease pattern. I think that is an area uh, for to work on. Also, uh, I think uh, scope for interoperability of animal and human vaccination system. So we have been talking about rabies. So where vaccination is happening both for uh, human as post-exposure prophylaxis as well as dog, dog vaccination. 
So uh, currently what uh, we have started is uh, UNDP has supported the government in, in the rollout of the electronic vaccine intelligence network and then uh, the COVID and immune system for beneficiary tracking during COVID and now it's used in universal immunization program. So now government is using the same digital architecture to uh, basically track the vaccine supply chain of rabies vaccine as well as tracking of the rabies post-exposure prophylaxis doses. And uh, we, we are also in uh, discussion with the Ministry of Animal Husbandry to similarly digitalize their dog vaccination. So the, and the vision is that in future, when both of these are uh, digitalized, there can be interoperability of uh, rabies information within these different sectors. And similarly, we, we, we are also uh, recently, Ministry has recently launched, launched a rabies helpline, which is also following a One Health approach. So I'll just show you, show about, uh, talk about it in the subsequent slides. Uh, of course, uh, then the other area which, we, we, which needs work and which, where there is a lot of scope is uh, the community outreach, how we can digitalize the community outreach system. So this uh, uh, One Health program for prevention and control of zoonosis beyond the Sentinel surveillance site, they have another component that is community outreach, that in creating awareness at the community level with involving different sectors, uh, so that more cases are referred to the sentinel sites. So can we think of some digitalization in the line uh, of some best practice? For example, in Thailand, uh, there is a system called uh, participatory One Health uh, Disease Dese Detection System, which is known as POD, which has done well uh, in terms of uh, community level detection, as well as uh, giving early one warnings uh, on any increasing trend of any disease. So similar system has uh, in a possibility or scope in the days ahead. So uh, as I was mentioning, uh, for rabies, these new activities have started. And uh, uh, the, in fact, Puducherry's the state action plan was already released. And Tamil Nadu will be releasing shortly. And uh, digitalization, as I was mentioning, currently uh, this digitalization of rabies vaccine supply chain as beneficiary tracking is uh, being piloted in five states uh, and UT of the country, but next year it will be scaled up across the country. Uh, so this is just uh, showing. So in now what will happen is similar to our COVID vaccination. If you can recall, we used to get a vaccination certificate after our uh, getting our doses. So now all the uh, post-exposure prophylaxis uh, uh, beneficiaries will be getting the certificate. And if someone is stopping their vaccination in between, uh, they will be tracked and their uh, full doses will be completed. So the other initiative that Government of India has done is the launch of a rabies helpline, uh, which is again uh, taking a One Health approach. That means there will be linkages with the animal sector uh, through the helpline. So I am going to talk about that. So as you said, this rabies helpline is basically giving you information about your nearest vaccination center. So if you want to know where is the nearest vaccination center near where, where you are, you can get it from there. Uh, if you need any information of first aid, you can get it from there. And also information re regarding the rabies, uh, ARV or ARS. Also, uh, it is envisaged that uh, what will the helpline do? These are all inbound calls that, that they are getting from the citizen. But the helpline will also have an inventory of uh, details of all the municipal and uh, animal husbandry officers area wise. So based on the animal bite cases, they will refer that to outbound call to those officers there and so that they can plan their uh, stray dog vaccination or animal birth control measures. So I think, uh, thank you. I'll stop here and look forward to the question. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya. Our final key expert speak, uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Sri Kumar. Um, and um, Dr. Sri Kumar is the head of Department of Wildlife Sciences, and we are very privileged to have him here. A very good afternoon to all. Uh, let me at the outset thank uh, Dr. Selva Vinayagam for having me here. Um, 
what I intend to talk here has been probably covered by all the other speakers, uh, my earlier speakers, um, the director as well as the minister and my fellow panelist, panelists. Uh, I'm uh, happy to be here uh, to give the veterinary side perspective of One Health and especially as a person who um, travels on two horses. I'm basically a veterinary parastologist who now manages the Department of Wildlife Science. So uh, my mandate is basically looking after wild animal health as well as captive wild animals, free range and wild animals. So my ventures into forests with wild, uh, my uh, interaction with wildlife, this has given me an uh, outlook as to what is lacking basically in our approach towards One Health. The previous speakers have actually given many uh, fine lines that I can uh, probably pick on and uh, elaborate on. Dr. Selva Vinayam, when he started his speech, talked about local homegrown research, which is very, very essential and which we lack a lot. The minister used a beautiful line that's information that helps us make decisions. It's very important. And uh, Dr. Dinesh Nari said the data is the key. Actually, I was part of a, a conclave, a meeting which, uh, which was convened in uh, February 2020. That, that was early days for COVID. And we were asked to prioritize about 40 zoonotic diseases. Uh, the, the, it was an intersectorial meet and we had veterinarians, uh, medicos and um, health policy makers. We all put our heads together. There were about 40 diseases, including COVID. And we were given about eight parameters of varying weightages based on which we, could, we need to actually evaluate them and see what is a priority disease in India. So uh, at that time, I distinctly remember we had about 35,000 COVID cases in the world and three in India. In Kerala, there are, there are three expatriates who had come in with COVID. And we put our heads together for about two days and uh, drew out a priority list in which COVID was uh, 26th in number. So we all headed back home and hardly a, a month elapsed and the entire world shut down. So that tells us how wrong decisions can be made on poor data. We had absolutely no data on uh, COVID at that point of time and we were relying on data that, has, that, that had to be supplied from others. And when we put it together, a top agency like NCDC came out with, I mean, that paper I know that is never published or uh, brought out. And I was very sure when I came out that we have decided COVID is 26, so don't worry about it, but that was not how it went out. So now I know that you know, we already know diseases are there in the wildlife. Uh, One Health in includes animals that are livestock as well as uh, wild animals. And uh, many programs have been well designed to tackle those diseases that are jumping in from domestic animals. That include your mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, anthrax, rabies, all that have excellent programs that have made inroads in checking the disease. Of course, we need to go a long way still. But what about those diseases that are waiting at the fringes of the forest waiting to come in? We know that uh, there are many wild animals and we know that these wild animals, all of them carry so many diseases and some of them can be of great importance to humans. What are we doing to counter them? Are we going to just wait till the next COVID-like disease comes in and then play catch up or do something to know what is going to come in and take proactive steps? This is where we need to make a decision. In October, we had another meeting. Uh, Dr. Sirinji was also part of it where the emphasis was on wildlife one health. What are the diseases that are going to be coming? What do we do, do, need to do to counter them? Uh, we had lots of discussion, but I don't think a white paper has as yet emerged from it. We are waiting for it. In the meanwhile, I'd like to tell you how uh, forests and especially fringe forest areas are very important for diseases. Can you go to the next slide, please? And click on the CLM, please. Yeah. Uh, I work in uh, the Madras Veterinary College, which is one of the busiest hospitals in the animal hospitals in the world. And you know that when any, when any animal is brought in, they are stressed out, they defecate. So there are dog and cat feces all over the place. And for the past 20 years, I've never had an incidence of a disease. In June, I was in the forest for a wildlife census. I was there for three, three days in the core jungle. And as soon as I came back, within a week, I had this small itching on the right side of my foot, immediately I knew that it was a cutaneous larva migrants. So I didn't treat it, I was just monitoring, go around, look how it moves, the distance it travels per day and all that I was monitoring my own leg. Finally, I took a small incision from that 
point and I found out, next, next slide please. Yeah, you can see that the organism sitting right there, the larva, which, whatever it was. So the forests are rich areas for pathogens getting to humans. What I'm trying to in, 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 in emphasize here is that. So there are many diseases that are waiting. They are not actually diseases that incapacitate these wild animals. These animals are perfectly healthy, but any overlap of uh, the urban and silvery cycle can help these diseases to come into humans. Especially the protected areas or what we call as the sanctuaries and forests in India are highly fragmented. So you know that there will be dense forests rich in wild fauna, which is interspersed and immediately settled with a human habitation which is dense with humans. And interaction happens all the time. Exchange of parasites happen all the time. And this can be very, a classical example can be Kerala, where you know that uh, wildlife diseases are occurring very often, right? So this fragmentation and interaction, and as well as an, a heightened animal activism. In a year where people would not mind about a bat lying on the road, now we want to pick it up and have a photo and put it up in Facebook saying that I saw this, right? This close interaction, all of them can lead to another outbreak and disease, which can be just like COVID incapacitating, right? So where do you stand here? So the livestock, was, as I said, there is nothing that, that has been put in place for monitoring or surveilling a wild animal disease that is going on. So the fragmentation is very important. Now, uh, what do we do to stop that? If the disease is there, if there are many countries that actually are proactive in monitoring what is happening in their wildlife. Uh, for example, CSIRO in Australia, it has huge ballasts that are uh, installed all over the northern border, which takes in the air that's coming across the sea, monitors what are the vectors that are being carried uh, with, along with it, and looks into what are the uh, pathogens that are being carried in it. It could be a culicoides, it could be something. So there is nothing that is put in place now in India to have a baseline database as to what is the disease that's going on in the wildlife, especially in the wildlife. So in this, we have significance of selected animals, like for example, the bats and the rodents. By their design, they are created or they are evolved to hold so many pathogens without showing any clinical signs. And especially bats, they forage a long way from their original abode. So from the deep, depth of the forest, they can actually come into human habitations. They need not actually interact with humans, but still they can leave behind vect um, uh, objects that are infected with pathogens that can actually infect humans. So with all this, what could be the way forward? So what I would say is that at this point, we can make a small step forward, having a, uh, a kind of a, a way for what to do in the next few, few years uh, first is to identify what are the potential fringe areas. There are forests and there are forest fringe areas. So in every state, probably we can identify certain forest fringe areas that are potentially able, to, that, that might be potential flashpoints where a disease can actually jump into humans. For example, in Tamil Nadu, we have Nilgiris, we have E-Road, we have other areas along the Western Ghats where humans interact very closely with wild animals. We can probably start with a few of those potential fringe areas, maybe mark them up for identification. And in them, we can actually have a, an SOP by which we can monitor them. And here comes this, another problem. Unlike in livestock, for example, in a poultry shed, you can just walk in, uh, pick out a couple of chickens, slaughter them, and check for path pathogens. But here, all the animals that we are talking about, they are protected by the Wildlife Protection Act, and it is very difficult to access them, any samples from them, except probably for dung. And the forest departments of most states very play very close to the heart. They don't give as much permit for people to go in and freely collect samples. So the forest people, the, the personnel from forest, like forest department should also be brought into this fold. And we should have a program by which we can collect material. It could be, for example, the period, periodicity can be set by data uh, once in a year, twice in a year, or four times in a year in a particular area we can go collect a wide array of vectors, for example, ticks, uh, dipterans, which could be include flies and um, uh, mosquitoes, or, and even uh, snails, which are potential vectors for trematodes. All that can be collected and scanned for the presence of pathogens. And we can generate a, a baseline data as to what is happening all over India. Getting samples from wildlife, as I say, is very, very difficult. 
But then uh, veterinarians are frequently called to do necropsies of wild animals that are dead in the forest. These opportunistic samples should be collected. And we should have an SOP by which, for example, a, a tiger or a wild carnivore is dead somewhere in the field. An SOP is given to the veterinarian so that he collects a set of samples for identifying other pathogens in them. Next, please. Next, please. Next one. Next one, please. Sorry. Yeah. This tells us, this is actually a, an amalgamation of data from various studies. Some of them pointed for uh, uh, blood uh, protozoa and others, which are uh, opportunistic studies. Wherever you take in the world, you know, wild animals are full of pathogens. So uh, some of them, the baby share can be uh, pathogenic, it can be zoonotic, and we have uh, uh, so many rickets here like Ehrlichia phagocytophilum that, are, that can cause debilitating disease. So such a data we don't have except for one outbreak in tigers, uh, in lions in uh, central India where we had a viral disease going in Babesia. We have absolutely no data about what is the um, uh, uh, prokaryotic pathogens that are present in wild animals in India. So such a study would give us a base data as to what could be the pathogen. It could be a Babesia that is there somewhere in a rodent or a uh, vivarid in uh, Kerala which can potentially be a pathogen for humans. And from this, all this NADRAS and other studies, we know that you know, the livestock is pretty much covered in that, but not the wildlife. So uh, the, the, the idea would be first to have a fringe area uh, selected, and from the fringe area have an SOP by which we can collect uh, vectors and look for pathogens in them, and then an opportunistic, sam opportunistic sampling of wild animals that are dead for an array of uh, pathogens. And for the diagnostics, you know, the COVID has given us a blessing that we have so many other uh, VDRL facilities that have come up. So uh, diagnostics have probably become accentuated because of uh, the presence of COVID. We can use that and also do some capacity building for uh, uh, local personnel so that they can look into a wide array of disease and then generate a database. And unless we have such a database that gives us an idea about what is lurking in the wildlife, we cannot actually move forward and have a concrete policy as to how to prevent them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, any audience, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, so we had a discussion about the COVID pandemic and the pandemic. Is it okay? Huh? Uh, 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 I thank all the panelists. It's a wonderful uh, activity. Yes, yes, please. I request our DPH sir to participate. No, no, because sir was mentioning we are discussing more on rabies and the other inventory program. The another big challenge is the snake bite also. So, in fact, in our state of Tamil Nadu, we have trained all our medical officers uh, in primary health centers, including the VHN, CHNs, and also the grassroots uh, workers who are going to MTM work. People also, we have done an online program, and in person, we have covered 12 districts. So, ASV is available in all the PHCs, available 24 by 7, and it's given free of cost. So that kind of a support system where human-animal interaction is another challenge in our country, especially state like Tamil Nadu where agriculture is a major problem. We have a snake bite issues, but we are going towards zero death due to snake bite also. I request our DPH sir to felicitate the co-chair, Dr. Dinesh Nair. Followed by the panelists, Dr. Raghunandanan and Dr. Tripathi Bodhre. To Dr. Tripathi Bodhre.
Now I request co-chair of the panel discussion to honor the other panelists, Dr. Siranjeevi Bhattacharya. Also, I request our co-chairperson to honor our uh, Dr. C. Shri Kumar. Sir. 